We're recording. Okay. So thank you. I, I'm now going to call the Finance Committee meeting of February 15, 2022 to order. Um, it is uh, three minutes after nine o'clock. And uh, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Um, instructions are in the agenda that has been posted. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort is being made to ensure that public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by technological means. Um, I now need to go through the process of um, making sure that all of the members of the committee can um, be uh, hear me and be heard. So as you, your name, um, as I ask, uh, uh, please respond just to indicate that you're here. Um, and I think that uh, we should try and to the greatest extent possible, have everybody moot their um, microphone so that we can uh, get on to the first agenda item of the day after that, which will be the audit presentation. And I will introduce Tanya Campbell to those who don't know and, uh, Tanya in a minute. But first, uh, let's go through just to make sure that everybody can uh, participate fully. Uh, so I'll go by first names, uh, Lynn. Present. And Bob? Present. Bernie? Present. Matt? Present. Michelle? Present. Kathy? Here. Okay, so I, um, we have um, four of the five members who are um, councilor members and uh, we have all members who are resident members and our uh, last council member will be joining us in a few minutes. Um, we have a busy agenda today and I'm going to do my best to adhere to our agreement on uh, time limits for meetings. Uh, we've last two meetings gone over by about 15 minutes, but uh, We've uh, stayed well under the three hours that had been last year's habit, and I'm still driving to make that happen because I appreciate that daytime meetings are difficult. And uh, so and I thank everybody. Um, so with that, um, we also serve, in addition to being finance committee, um, the finance committee was merged with the audit committee a couple of years ago, and uh, we have the responsibility of, of being the audit committee and receiving a presentation for, from our um, certified public accountant regarding uh, the findings of the audit. And um, the, I therefore would like to introduce uh, to the new members, uh, somebody who's uh, presented for several years and was here last year uh, from Melanson, which is our um, firm that has been providing these services. Uh, and uh, Tanya is uh, based in Melanson's Greenfield office and uh, does a lot of work with uh, cities and towns, and uh, we benefit from her experience. Um, Tanya, it's nice to see you again, and welcome. Nice to see you so. all, thank you. I'm going to share my screen, possible, let's see. Can and everyone see the- Tanya, can I just clarify one thing? Sure. 
Tanya's too nice to do this, but it's Tanya, right? It's, yeah, it's Tan Tanya. Yeah. Tanya. So I want to clarify this for everybody. So, um, that's okay. all right, go, sorry, go ahead. Not the first time that's happened. It won't be the last. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you. Um, can everyone see the full presentation on the screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here to today to present the results of the town's fiscal year 2021 audit. And I wanted to start by giving a kind of a brief overview of the roles and responsibilities of everyone kind of involved in this call in terms of us as your independent auditors, management, um, as well as the finance committee's responsibilities. And then briefly discuss um, the town's financial statements and some of the key numbers in, in those statements and um, then talk about the the comment in the town's management letter briefly. Um, please feel free to stop me at any time as I'm going through here. If you have questions, um, jump in. Now, in terms of the roles and responsibilities of Melanson as your independent auditors, we are ultimately responsible for expressing an opinion on the town's financial statements. We're also responsible for planning and performing our audit to provide reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance, that the financial statements are free of a material misstatement, whether caused by error or fraud. An audit does not provide 100% assurance. We do not come in and pour through every single transaction. We don't look at every bill that was paid. We don't trace out every single receipt. That's not what an audit is designed, designed to do. And we would be there for months if that was the case. Instead, our audits are conducted under a set of standards known as government auditing standards. Those standards require that we plan and perform our audit using a concept known as materiality. Now, materiality will vary based on the size of the entity, and it also varies based on the different um, funds in the town. So for instance, in fiscal year 2021, materiality for the town's general fund, which is your main operating fund, was about $600,000. That doesn't mean we don't look at anything below that amount because we certainly do. It just means that auditing standards say we should focus on the balances at or above that level. Now, as part of our audit process, we perform um, a variety of different audit testing procedures. Um, the first of them being internal control testing. And as part of that process, we evaluate the town's internal controls and then test those controls throughout the year to make sure they're operating effectively. So for instance, we'll look at vendor payments and select a sample of payments made throughout the year, trace to make sure that they're properly approved, they're in the right fiscal year, um, they're charged to the correct account, things along that nature, all those internal control um, processes. We also perform what's known as substantive testing. So in that case, we'll take a balance that's reported in the town's general ledger, ultimately in the financial statements, and test to make sure that that balance is supported by um, detailed support. So for instance, the cash balance in the town's financial statements is, can be traced back to reconciled bank statements from the treasurer's office. We all, and lastly, um, we perform analytical procedures. So we look at balances year to year, see um, if something looks unusual or if it um, agrees with what we know is going on with the town or just the world in general, what's going on now. It's been a little crazy these past few, two years doing analytical procedures, that's for sure. Everything's kind of all over the road. Um, but in a nutshell, that's a, a kind of a brief overview of the different types of um, procedures and testing that we do during the audit process. Now, in terms of management's responsibilities, management is, responsible for the town's financial statements. They're also responsible for establishing and maintaining effective internal control over the financial reporting process. Um, so making sure, you know, reviewing the financial statements and, and making sure those agree to the town's um, internal reports that were provided since we do prepare those on behalf of the town, the financial statements. Um, but the town is, or the management is responsible for reviewing them and making sure they're accurate and contain um, um, adequate or accurate information, excuse me. Management is also responsible for ensuring that the town complies with the various laws and regulations that are applicable to all of its activities. And then as part of the audit process, 
they are responsible for making all the financial data and records available to us in a timely fashion so we, we can complete our audit efficiently and effectively. Um, and at the end of the audit, management is responsible for providing us with a letter that confirms the various representations that were made to us as part of the audit process. So essentially confirming that you know reports that were given are true and accurate. Um, and any inquiries we made, the responses are um, accurate to the best of their knowledge and, and ability, and that they've made us aware of anything that we should be aware of as part of the audit process itself. Now, in terms of the finance committee's responsibilities, you know, the finance committee is responsible for oversight of the entire process, um, which is why we are having this meeting today and discussing the results of the town's audit. Um, responsible for oversight of the, of the financial statements themselves, as well as the internal control process and where needed any risk assessment evaluation. Um, as things come up during the year, if there's issues that need to be addressed, they're responsible for oversight of that process as well. And because you are a subset of the town council, you're also responsible for helping um, you know, them understand the financial statements if need be. If they ask questions, you are kind of the go-to in between um, to help them and, and educate them as well. And you're also responsible for reviewing management letter um, comments and recommendations as part of the audit process. Anyone have any questions before I move on? All right. Now, in terms of the financial statements, they are presented under rules established by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, also known as GASB. Um, that is the entity that creates the standards that tell us how things should be reported in the town's financial statements, and you'll see a multitude of references to GASB throughout the financial document itself. Now, there are essentially five components to your financial statements. The first is the audit opinion. Now, the audit opinion is actually the only couple pages of the financial statements that belongs to us as your independent auditors. As I mentioned before, the financial statements are ultimately the responsibility of management, and we are responsible for expressing an opinion on the statements. In fiscal year 2021, we issued the town an unqualified opinion, meaning that based on the results of our testing, we found that the town was in compliance with generally accepted accounting principles. Next comes management's discussion and analysis, which is um, a required narrative, it kind of briefly summarizes the financial statements and what's included in the statements, as well as some of the key numbers and results of operations from the past fiscal year. So if you didn't want to, you know, scan through the whole 100 page document, that's a kind of a good place to start. It gives you kind of a brief overview and, um, you know, a, a, a summary of what happened during the year. Next, you have your two sets of financial statements, your government-wide statements and your fund basis statements. And we'll, we'll take a look at those, um, one of each of those in just a minute and kind of touch on some of the key numbers um, on those statements. And lastly, you have your footnotes and your required supplementary information, which provide more detailed information to support the actual numbers reported on the statements themselves. So for instance, if you think about the town's net OPEB liability, that is one line in your financial statements, but there's a great deal of information and disclosures related to that liability, which can be found in the footnotes, um, including information on um, the assumptions used by the actuary, um, information about the town's OPEB trust fund, things like that, that, that provide much more detail to support those numbers themselves. Can I ask you to pause for just a moment while we confirm that um, Councillor Walker can hear us and be heard? She just joined us. Hello, yes, I can hear everyone. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, thanks, Alicia. And I wanted to make sure we got um, Matt as well. I'm not sure if we confirmed that he could hear and be heard at the beginning of the meeting. I confirmed, Athena, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Do I have any questions before I move on? Thanks, Tanya, please go ahead. Okay, perfect. All right, so next I want to just take a look at some of the, um, the numbers on the statements themselves. So if you look at, you have the financials open, um, it's page 17. 
If you have the PDF, it's on page 20 of the PDF itself. Um, and the first page I wanna look at is the town's balance sheet. Now the balance sheet is one of your fund basis statements. Um, and these statements more closely resemble um, the information that's reported in the town's internal records. So there's very little differences in terms of um, the numbers that are reported in these statements versus what the town um, has in the general ledger. You know, ma mainly the modifications that we make are in terms of how things are presented um, in the financial statements where, you know, we never have to make a ton of uh, any, really any audit adjustments, but we're, we're making for adjustments are things that just kind of make things align with how they need to be disclosed. And that is important. Um, it means that the numbers that you are looking at as council members and making decisions on on a day-to-day -day basis are true and accurate. Um, and that has always been the case of the town that you know always had good financial, um, good financial department. Um, everything is in order, reconciled. Um, you know, no issues, no issues there. Now, in terms of the balance sheet, there's a couple columns, um, and I only have one shown here because I just wanted to talk about one of these numbers. But the um, the column that's labeled general fund is actually the town's general fund and the stabilization fund combined. Um, this was a, a GASB statement, result of a GASB statement issued back in 2011 um, that required them to be consolidated in order to um, align with how states report their rainy day funds. Um, those are part of the state's general fund. So as a result, towns have to show their stabilization funds in the general fund column of the financial statements. Um, if you're looking at the full page itself, there's a couple other columns there for um, the ambulance fund and the ARPA fund, which are what are considered major funds because of the volume of activity or the balances in those funds. Um, and then the last column is your non-major governmental funds, which are the rest of the town's um, special revenue funds, your grant funds, uh, capital project funds, as well as your trust funds. Now. In terms of the key number I'm going to look at this page is the unassigned fund balance number in the general fund, and that um, that number just you know, 20, almost twenty five million dollars is made up of two balances. Um, one, the first portion of that is the town stabilization fund, which was about just over fourteen million dollars at the end of fiscal year twenty twenty one, and that balance represents just over 25% of the town's tax levy, which is a very, very healthy balance. It's probably one of the highest balances I've seen in terms of the audits that I do, and I do close to 40 of them a year. Um, very healthy balance. You know, the town has made a concerted effort over the years to set money aside into that fund. Um, and it, you know, continues to grow um, on an annual basis. So definitely kudos to the town for that. It's, it's, uh, it's a very, um, a very large number. It's very um, prudent of the town to, to do that and have that money set aside if, if need be. <clears throat> the other portion of that balance is the town's unreserved general fund balance, which if you think of it, it's essentially the um, starting point for the town's free cash calculation. So that's what's left in the general fund after any reserves or anything that's required to be set aside has been set aside. Um, and at the end of fiscal year 21, that balance was just under $10.5 million, which represents 18.5% of the town's tax levy. <clears throat> also a very healthy balance. Um, you know, the town has always had um, a, a fairly big general fund unreserved balance, again, because of the financial policies and uh, procedures that the town has in place, um, you know, in terms of you know, you do spend free cash and use free cash, but on a yearly basis, you are, you know, budgeting your revenues conservatively, you're budgeting your expenses conservatively, and that allows that fund balance to replenish itself on an annual basis. So, um, again, very healthy balance. The town is, you know, doing doing things right. Um, again, one of the highest um, percentage-wise of unreserved fund balances to the tax levy I see um, as part of my audits. The town had uh, certified free cash at the end of fiscal year 21 of just over or just um, under $9 million. 
which equates to about 11.5% of the entire annual operating budget. Um, DOR recommends a minimum of 3 to 5% minimum. Um, so again, that is a healthy number and that's a result of having um, good financial practices in place. Um, does anyone have any questions on this page? Oh, Matt does. Can you just tell us where the unreserved um, balance can be found? The unreserved balance and the stabilization fund balance, so that 10 million and the 14 million make up the unassigned fund balance number there. The two numbers together are, com are combined into that unassigned 24.668. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Just telling you, my question would be uh, whether you're um, aware of plans for the, uh, especially the stabilization fund to use for major building projects that we see ahead of us. And uh, the, to some extent, stabilization fund was um, intentionally increased in order to allow uh, management of the, um, those projects. Yeah, and that's that's a good practice. I mean, the more you can set aside to fund with um, stabilization fund without really putting a dent in your stabilization fund, um, the less obviously the town will have to borrow in, in long-term debt costs. So, you know, the town, a lot of the towns I audit have a stabilization fund and a capital stabilization fund. So they distinguish between the two. Um, the town of Amherst has always just had one stabilization fund, which is, is fine. Um, but, you know, putting aside money into that fund to use for capital projects at a later date makes sense. Um, you know, it's a good, it's a good process. It's a good use of the stabilization fund. Obviously you don't want to drain it to the point where you're using, you know, 10 million of the 14 million in, in kind of one shot, because then that will be, that'll shrink your stabilization fund and it, you know, it won't leave you a cushion in case something happens um, in future years, but it, it is, um, it is a good strategy to use, um, to set aside money and then use it for capital projects. Okay, I, and I'll just conclude that. Thank you uh, by pointing out that at one point um, towards the end of the former uh, town government, which was a town meeting, select board government, town meeting was presented with a proposal to create a uh, stabilization fund for capital projects mm -hmm. and uh, uh, town meeting uh, declined to do so. They did not want to decrease the commitment to the stabilization fund, but they did not understand or support the purpose of um, splitting the funds. So that was rejected by a town meeting and it's a decision that has not been revisited since. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, you know, it's, I guess, town preference in terms of what you want to do there. If you want to specifically say, we're going to be setting these aside for capital items in the future, you know, in the sense it makes a way to create it or sense it, um, it makes sense, excuse me, to create a capital stabilization fund, but um, it's not necessary. Thank you. Uh, now, Lynn, you have your hand up. Yeah, just one more uh, piece with regard to the stabilization fund. We also, in our financial guidelines, have a uh, requirement that it not go below a certain level, regardless of how we're using it, in this case, as a float for our various um, capital projects. Good practice as well. So the next page I want to look at is the statement of net position, which um, the page we're going to focus on is page 15 um, of the financial statements, and it's page 18 of the PDF document. Now, your statement of net position is one of your government-wide statements, which um, these statements consolidate the various funds of the town together and only distinguish between governmental activities and your business type activities. So your governmental activities include things such as your general fund, your stabilization fund, 
um, all, all the funds that were on the previous page. So your, your major funds like ambulance, ARPA, and um, all the other grant and capital and trust funds um, of the town. And then the business type activities represent the town um, the town's enterprise funds. Um, so your water, your sewer, your transportation, and your landfill, those are all consolidated together in that column. Now, the intent of the government-wide statements is to take your business operations and show them, or your government operations and show them like a business, excuse me. So when we consolidate all those funds together, we also add items such as the town's long-term assets and your long-term liabilities, which aren't reported on your fund basis statements. Um, so while these statements do a really good job in, show, in terms of showing the true assets and liabilities of the town itself, they're not um, the statements you want to use to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, because this is not how the town operates on a day-to-day -day basis. You do have these liabilities, they are out there, um, but you're paying them as you go. Um, every year is part of your annual operating budget. So um, these statements are good. They are looked at by you know, the, the bond rating agencies and, and such, um, but they're not used for kind of the day-to-day -day decisions of the town. Now, in terms of some of the key numbers on this page, we're gonna look at two of the town's um, biggest liabilities, uh, your net pension liability and your net OPEB liability. And the town's net pension liability is your share of the Hampshire County Retirement System's unfunded liability. Last year, that number was um, right around $54 million. And this year it ends up at just over 47 million. So there was a 6.6 .6 million dollar decrease in that liability from last year. Um, and there was a couple of factors that contributed to that. Um, your share of the whole liability itself. So that all, there's a bunch of different towns and entities that are part of the Hampshire County Retirement System. And every year, um, your share of the whole liability itself changes slightly. Um, and this year it decreased slightly from the prior year. Um, so because your share of the whole system went down slightly, your share of the liability also went down. In addition, the system itself had better market results for, um, last fiscal year, which was consistent pretty much across the board for all retirement systems. So as a result, they had more assets at the end of the year, making the overall liability itself smaller. So therefore your share of the liability went down as well. Does anyone have any questions about the, the net pension liability? That, you know, that liability, the town is funding that. You do have a funding schedule. So ultimately that, you know, should continue to go down over the years as you're, as you're paying your annual assessment. Um, obviously there's different factors that play into that in terms of um, market results and things like that, because the actuary is, is predicting what's going to happen. And then, you know, every two years looking back and seeing if what they thought was gonna happen did come to fruition um, in terms of um, market results and, and stuff like that. So, you know, the liability does, does trend downward typically, um, or it should trend downward, but it kind of, you know, slowly, I guess, over time because of the different factors used in the, the valuation. Now, the next um, number I wanted to talk about was a net OPEB liability, which represents the town's share of retiree health insurance costs. Um, last year's liability was almost $68 million, and this year the liability ended up um, $74.6 million. So that was actually a $6.6 .6 million increase in the liability. Um, the main reason for this change was the change in the discount rate. So the actuary um, has an assumption for investment rate of return, uh, which is averaged with your municipal, with the municipal bond rate as of 630. And that's what they use to, to determine what the discount rate is uh, because your, your, um, your trust is not fully funded at this point in time. So they average those two numbers together. And, and just generally speaking in the last couple of years, the municipal bond rate has decreased. So as a result, your discount rate went down. Um, and when your discount rate goes down, your liability goes up. So that was the main reason for the increase in the um, OPEP liability from the prior year. 
Now, unlike the pension liability, there's no requirement to, to fund this liability at this time, um, but the town has established an OPEP trust fund. And at the end of fiscal year 21, there was a balance of about $10 million in that fund. Um, the town contributed just over $400,000 in fiscal year 2021. And you know, similar to the retirement system, um, the OPEB trust fund had uh, a very well, a very good year and in terms of investment returns in 2021 as well. Um, so that helped that balance grow. Um, at this point, at, at the end of fiscal 21, the OPEB itself um, is about, or the, the trust is about 12% funded. So if we take a look at the whole OPEB liability, your trust represents about 12% of the total liability. Um, so that's, you know, right on par and or above the levels of, you know, most of the cities and towns that we see. The, the town has made an effort again over the years to put money aside into that trust fund to, to grow that balance. Um, so uh, it is a big number, but the town is making efforts to, to set aside money and, you know, hopefully get that number to go down, continue to go down over the years. Does anyone have any questions on that? Tanya, can I give a little um, just context um, looking forward? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the Hampshire County retirement system, as Tanya mentioned, we're about 70% funded. That system, the, the unfunded liability in that system is supposed to be completely gone um, around 2033 or 34. I'm not sure if they've changed their date officially. Um, at that point, the expectation is that the amount we pay the Hampshire County retirement system should go down quite a bit. Um, right now, the majority of our payment to them is for that unfunded liability and not for the actual, the current year costs. Um, so once that unfunded liability is gone, we should see a, a sizable reduction in the payment to Hampshire County. Um, and a lot of communities, and I think what we're thinking as well, um, at that point are, are going to kind of re-divert those funds from going to the pension into OPEB to start making greater progress on the OPEB front. Um, we're trying to still make progress at the same time, but um, it's hard to make um, significant progress on both fronts because the liabilities are so large. Um, so again, once we get the Hampshire County retirement liability addressed, which we have to by law right now, um, we would then sort of turn our attention to the OPEB liability and start focusing more funds there. That is a good strategy. And, and again, I've, I've seen or heard um, towns discuss that, you know, at some point when that pension liability goes away, we can then, you know, take the money we're already raising in the budget every year and kind of Ship that over to OPEB to, to really reduce that liability in, in bigger strides. Uh, I don't know why I've never thought to ask this question before. Who holds this liability? Is it the state or who? Which I'm sorry, which liability were you talking the, about? Both the pension and the OPED. In other words, somebody holds the liability per se. So the Hampshire County Retirement System hires an actuary to determine what the, what the liability of the system is. So how many people they have as active, how many people are retired and, and what, you know, how long they're gonna live and what the benefit payments are gonna be to the, all those members at that point in time. Okay. So they have this big liability and then they say, okay, well, you have a hundred million dollar liability, 50 million in assets that are gonna be used to pay those, which means you have a $50 million unfunded liability out there. Um, and then that gets distributed to Obviously, those are made up numbers, but um, those get distributed to all the different members of the retirement system based on their, their share of the, um, the liability. So, you know, thank you. You, you don't have adding, much control it's over based that. On actuarials. Yes. Yeah. And adding to what Tanya said, these are the town's liabilities. So these are, there are liabilities on our, our, our financial statements. Um, OPEB is, more reflective of our staff specifically because they do a deep dive into our, our staff. Um, the Hampshire County Retirement System is more, because it's a group, it's more aggregated and there's more um, sort of allocations, um, but they are town liabilities. Yeah. So if we were to close up shop, which we can't, but if the town was to close up shop, <laughs> we would have to pay these liabilities because these would be the, the estimated benefits that are due to um, current and past employees. Sean, for the new members of the com uh, committee and for public who are watching this, um, 
Could you just uh, explain the difference between pension liability and OPEB liability? Yeah, so the, the pension liability, um, when you retire from Amherst, uh, there's a, we're part of the Hampshire County Retirement System, so there's a um, certain percentage of your, your average salary that you get paid, um, and you have different options for how it gets paid to you, but you get uh, it gets paid to you until you pass away. Um, so that's sort of what you think of, it's, you know, sort of our version of social security, because we're not eligible for social security through the town um, employment. Um, so that's what the pension liability reflects. And so again, this number reflects, if, if we were to close shop today, the people who are currently retired and the people who have, um, who are in our system that could retire, how much is owed to them. Um, and you know, using actuarial tables until they pass away. So that's why it's such a large number because um, it's more than just our current employees. Um, and then OPEB is specifically health insurance, um, health insurance and life insurance um, and some smaller smaller things, but primarily health insurance. Um, so same thing, it's what are we paying? We, uh, when people retire from the town of Amherst, um, the town continues to pay a share of their health insurance. Um, it's the same share that we pay as active employees. So it's 75% or 80%. Um, depending on, on what plan you choose. And so the town maintains a liability for retirees until they pass away. Um, and so that's what this number reflects, that same sort of thing um, for both current and past employees. And for people who are just not aware, OPEB stands for other post-employment benefits and others other than pension. pension. Yeah. Lynn? Yeah. While you're on the topic, can you also just uh, refresh my memory and for new members, um, talk about what happened when Hampshire County was dissolved and how that all worked out? Yeah, Hampshire so oh, do you, do you add it, Tanya? You may have a better. No, that's fine. You, you, can, okay. you can start. I'll, I'll fill in. Here's what I think happened, Tanya. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> so, so when um, Hampshire County Council of Governments uh, dissolved, that liability for their um, employees was sort of being uh, split proportionally among all the members. Um, and in the past year or so, the state has agreed to take on that liability. So it's no longer um, being spread just among Hampshire County um, members. It's the state has taken that completely on. It was, it was a relatively small slice of the mm -hmm. overall system. So it's not a huge impact, but it was a positive right. impact in terms of what we had to come up with. Right. And I do think that the state did intend to take that over at some point. It just everything takes forever. So they were kind of getting that figured out in terms of what that actual number was. Again, like Sean said, it was not, uh, it was a very insignificant dollar amount overall. Um, so it had very little impact, I think, to the members itself, but obviously it's not your responsibility. So you shouldn't be you know, required to pay it, but the state is essentially going to um, buy that out of the system. Okay. Um, this may be in the longer report, Tanya, um, but on OPEB, what we're covering, what I understand what we're paying for, but we're paying for a premium. Are we also paying the employee share of the premium? And, and then my question actually goes with that. In the longer report, can I find that? In, is that in the report? So I, I don't need yeah. you to cite numbers. I just wasn't sure what where to look for it. Yes. There is a footnote that describes the um, the liability, what the town covers, what percentage the town pays um, of those costs, like 80, 70 or 75 or 80 um, percent. That that is in the financial statements. So. And, Kathy, and I'm actually Kathy, just, real, real a, quick can, on that, there's a there's a specific OPEB report as well. So it's in the yeah. audit report, sort of as a summary. But we post the actual OPEB reports on the accounting website. Okay. And that's from a actuary who does a that goes into much deeper detail yeah. about yeah. everything you might want to know about OPEB um, okay. ta tables and medical inflation, all, all that sort of stuff. OK, thank you. And I, you know, because what I was looking for is I think I believe we were told either last year or the year before we pay the commercial supplemental insurance, but we also pay the Medicare, the federal requirement for the Medicare premium. But I, I just wanted to look at that again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Does anyone else have any other questions on this page or these numbers? Okay. Um, next, I was just going to briefly talk about the issue noted in the town's management letter, and I believe you all have a copy of um, of that report. It's the much smaller report. 
um, which is good. Um, there are you know, briefly just three types of comments that can be reported in the town's management letter. Um, the first is a material weakness, which would be a deficiency in the town's internal control structure that is so great that a material misstatement could occur and nobody would have any idea what was going on. Um, there are none of those reported in the town's management letter, nor have we ever, I don't think, ever had um, a material weakness in the town's management letter, um, which, which is really good. Um, the next is a significant deficiency, which is also a deficiency in the internal control structure that is not as severe as a material weakness, but is still important enough to bring to the attention of management as a, as a major issue. Um, there's also none of those in the in the town's management letter this year. And again, I don't believe we've ever had a significant deficiency in the past as well. Last is the other issues, which is, you know, as part of the audit process, based on our testing, we found if we come across something that's either um, a suggestion for internal control improvement or an issue that was noted as part of our compliance testing, um, not of material concern, but still worth mentioning, um, that's the type of comment that's reported in the town's management letter this year. And that's typically what you see um, when we do have a management letter. Now, <clears throat> there's one comment in the town's management letter. And I, I don't have it on my, um, my presentation. I apologize for that. But um, it had to do with complying with procurement regulations. And as part of our audit process, we randomly select um, a few vendors, uh, vendor payments made throughout the year that would be subject to the procurement process based on the dollar amount that was spent by the town. Um, and then we test to make sure that the, the town followed the right procurement procedures and they have all, this, all the proper retaining um, supporting documentation, um, stuff like that, to make sure that they're complying with mass general laws related to procurement. Um, we found one instance where um, the school department contracted with a vendor for building improvements. Um, they considered it um, a emergency procurement based on the, the timing that the um, modifications need to take place in the summer before school got back into session. So, um, you know, in, in instances like that, master a law allows you to um, not go through the full procurement process um, and actually just solicit three bids, even though it's um, that normal dollar threshold would be subject to the bidding process. Um, but in order, in order to do that, you have to um, file a written waiver with uh, the state and then document your reason for why it was considered an emergency procurement. Um, and just because you wait too long and, and can't get that stuff done in time, that doesn't qualify as an emergency. You can't like create the emergency yourself, but um, you do have to document why it's an emergency, that you um, kind of complied with master and laws to the best of your ability. So if you can't do the full RFP process and solicit bids, you know, the next step down would be to solicit quotes, three written quotes, which they did do, um, but they didn't retain documentation to support why it was emergency or file for the waiver. So we just recommend that, um, you know, going forward that all that documentation um, is maintained and that the proper procedures are put in place to follow to meet the national law requirements. Tanya, can I just give a quick um, follow up mm -hmm. to that? Um, yeah. So since that time we have, um, we have put in place a new sort of control around procurements um, at the schools and and for all really all staff, but primarily for the schools um, to make sure that they're they're following all the steps. Um, and we also are going to be having sort of trainings with them and sort uh, ongoing sort of reviews with them, um, just so everyone knows. So that the school has their own business office that they handle. 99% of the stuff that happens at the schools and, and then we have handle everything else that happens throughout the town. Um, but we do work closely together. And so, um, and they are technically, they are under the town. So, um, so we'll work jointly with them to make sure there's no further issues. I don't know who had their hand up first, Bob or Kathy? Bob, okay. Hi. Um on it, in the uh, management letter, mm -hmm. um, it's on page three. I don't know if you have it in front of you or not, but the, yep. the, the, the second paragraph on page three starts about the school department contracted. It, that sentence is a little bit confusing. And I think your explanation was very, was very concise and very, I, th I understand what happened, 
but it says that only saw only sought quotes for the project, which confused me. So maybe if you just clarify what the school department did and didn't do in that okay. first paragraph, that would be much, much more helpful. Thank you. I see. Did you understand what I, what that means based on the uh, the conversation we just had? Like what they were supposed to do? They were supposed to go out to bid. Yeah, but I, okay. I understand. Okay. What they, I understand. You explained it very well, but it's okay. it, in the document here. It's a little confusing. Okay, I got you. I just want to make sure. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. I just. I. I. Thank you for the explanation. And um. So I had a question when I read that on the actual regs that oversee this. Um, if it's an emergency and then you need to apply for permission to do it in a different way, does the state have a process that they respond right away? You know, so in other words, you know, are you waiting a long time to get that? I um, mean, is there an expedited process when um, a town or school in this case asks for uh, doing something differently? I, Tanya, I can speak to that. If it's, so you've there, probably done that, Sean. Yeah. There is an expedited process. We had to yeah. do it. Um, we did it once in the past when we had the um, the gym floor when we had the pipe burst at the high school um, a few years ago. Flooded the gym is during the school year. There was you know concerns around mildew and things like <laughs> that because um, it was kids were using the gym and it really destroyed that whole that whole area of the high school. So um, they do get back to you pretty quickly. It's not. Um, Again, this is something we can clean up and fix. It's not a, it's not that the state's fault or anything like that. Thanks. That's that you you're answering because I thought if it's if it's an emergency, it means you need a quick answer. So yeah, there's there's a there's a whole process for it. You yeah. basically send an email with a narrative of it, and then they kind of get back to you. Um, my recollection wasn't within a few days, um, letting you know if it's been approved. Does anyone have any other questions? So this, my contact information, I can provide um, Sean with the, um, the PowerPoint so you guys have that. Just as an aside, as part of the, you know, when the town or when the you know, town went out to bid for audit, um, the audit um, these next couple of years, they did request that we have a change in principle. So I won't be doing this presentation next year. It'll be Scott McIntyre, who has been with our firm for over 30 years, probably 32, 33 years, um, you know, he's gonna provide kind of a, a fresh look and a fresh set of eyes on things. Um, you know, we work for the same firm, but we all have different experiences and run into different issues. So next year you'll be working with um, Scott, who you will, you will absolutely love, but I include his contact information here as well. And I'm always available, obviously, um, as the town has questions and, and things like that throughout the year. It's, it's not like I'm gonna completely disappear, but um, just FYI, there will be a new uh, principal in charge of the audit process next year. Kathy? Uh, yeah, I had a comment. I, this was excellent, Tanya, and I found the reports extremely easy to clear. Um, so what, what I saw in the report that I'm, I think it's the first time I've seen consolidation that I believe shows us the COVID money we got and the grants that are coming in on both on revenues, both schools. And um, so that is a process that when we see this again next year, we'll start to see the ARPA funds. So that's my question. Um, and are you talking about the, um, the third report that we don't usually touch on in the presentation? It's the um, audit report on government auditing standards. Yeah, and it just it provided a lot of useful detail that showed the flow of, flow of funds, and you had the and you had grant lines that were um, restricted, unrestricted, and I saw the big jump up in that. And yeah. and we and just for reference, we don't always see that in our regular general fund report because it's it's we we know about it, but I thought that was a really useful to know that it is in these reports and will be regularly there. So yes, yes, all the all the town's grants are in there. Um, and the other report that we issue is um, on the town's federal funds and the federal expenditures that happened during the year. Um, there was an increase in federal funding as there has been throughout the country these past couple of years in terms of um, COVID money. Um, and we did audit the town's um, 
coronavirus relief fund this past year. That was one of, that was the federal grant that we were required to audit. Um, and we had no issues, no compliance issues as a result of that testing. Um, you know, depending how the town spends down the ARPA funds, since that's such a big dollar amount that, you know, if they, if you spend a big chunk of that next year or 2022, this year you guys are in, um, it's likely we'll have to audit those expenditures as well um, in the next fiscal year audit. So there, there's formulas in terms of figuring out what we need to audit and whether it's high risk and, and things along that nature. But um, we did not, we did not find any issues with our audit of the coronavirus relief funds this past year. Thank you. Welcome. Sean? Uh, you can take Lynn first. Lynn? I just wanted to say thank you to Tanya. Um, and having been on the uh, group that did the selection for the future audit, nothing regarding the fact that we asked for a change in um, principles was a reflection of your service and we want to just thank you for your service. No problem. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Lynn stole my thunder. I was gonna I was gonna <laughs> thank um, I was gonna thank Tanya too and just let everyone know. So throughout the year we're constantly in contact with Tanya even when they're not doing the audit. Um, you know they are great resources for us whenever things come up that we have questions. You know we we try to make sure we don't ever have audit issues by making sure we ask the question before we do anything um, yeah. that, that, you know, is not hundred percent clear to us. And Tanya is amazing at getting back to us with, um, you know, the right way to do things, clarifying, you know, any, any confusion we have. Um, and they're always very forward thinking in terms of giving us heads up about changes in Gatsby rules. There's, you know, there's constantly new Gatsby's coming out. Um, they're, they're very good at giving us a head up on, heads up on that so that we can make sure we stay in compliance. Um, so I've, and I've worked with Tanya back when I was at the schools and I've always appreciated um, how much they, they really try to keep towns on the right track, um, but, but also fair if they find something, they let us know. Uh, well, we're handing out uh, uh, thanks and congratulations, uh, Sonia, Sean, the whole finance crew. Um, you know, this all, is- All Sonia, all Sonia on this all one. All Sonia. Well, <laughs> I mean, this is just an outstanding report. Yeah. Um, it should give everybody a great deal of, of security and assurance that our funds are being handled properly. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I, having lived through these audits, I know that they're pretty comprehensive and uh, uh, they're, they're a lot of work on staff's part as well. So, um, so thank you. So I think that we need to come up with um some sort of report back to the uh, council itself and uh, motion really does not need to go into great detail um, but uh, I don't know what we did last year in the way of a um, exact motion uh, but I, I did not go back and look at it um, but I was uh, thinking in terms of uh, something like the uh, finance committee reviewed the um, audit report with um, our principal at Belanson um, and uh, found that uh, it was a uh, reported a fair reflection of um, our financial management and uh, give us great confidence in our financial management and uh, leave our report to the, uh, and that'd be essentially what the core of the report be. Lynn? So moved. <laughs> do, just a question, do we need to recommend adoption of the report or is this it? You know, once we report that out, um, the council doesn't need to look at it. Is, am I correct? I think we don't really adopt it. Uh, yeah, that's so I'm fine with the I'm fine with the motion. It was a question. Yeah. I didn't ask Sean and or Sonia for prior practice if uh, either of you knew the answer to that. Yeah, it just says, um, I don't think it has to be voted. It, it, it says it will be filed um, in its final form of the town council. I think in the past, there's maybe been a little re finance committee report that goes with it. Um, okay. but I don't think it's been voted in the past. 
Okay, so Bill, do you have a motion a motion down essentially? Yep, I have a finance committee reviewed audit report with principal at Melanson and found that it reported a fair reflection of the town's financial management. So uh, is there a second to that motion? Lynn uh, seconded. So I think Lynn seconded, yeah. Lynn moved it actually, so we do need a second. Okay, Shane, Shane will second it. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion that's been made and seconded. Is there uh, any further discussion on the motion? And if not, uh, then I will just uh, go through uh, each member to indicate whether you're voting yes if you're a council member uh, and. Uh, are uh, therefore a voting member according to the um, charter provisions or whether you uh, support it if you're a resident member. Um, so I'll start with uh, Bob Hegner. Uh, Did you hear that? I support it. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. I did not. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, Kathy? Yes. Um, Felicia? Yes. Um, and I've, uh, I'm a yes. Uh, Michelle? Yes. And um, Bernie? Support the motion. Let's see, Matt. Support. I think that's it then. No, uh, Lynn. So uh, Lynn is I. Uh, Lynn Corbett. Thank you. So uh, it's a unanimous vote with uh, support of all three members who are resident members of the committee. So with that, um, I think that uh, we have we're done with the first part of our agenda. And also uh, want to thank uh, Tanya for uh, uh, Tanya for all of the work that she's done over the years and uh, the fact that uh, she's made this presentation many times to many different audit committees and uh, which I've served on several and not served on several. And uh, I, uh, you know, really uh, look forward to hopefully seeing you around again, but um, sure you'll see I, me I, I think, you know, I, I agree with what Lynn previously said, support that, so thank you. Thank you, uh, take care everyone, thank you. So with that, um, the next two, uh, three items that are gonna comprise most of the next hour, and uh, we'll uh, need to divide them up appropriately, is we need to, to have some discussion of the transportation fund, and then we have public comment and um, community preservation act recommendations. And, uh, so that's uh, how we're going to divide the time. I wanted to put public comment in uh, before we get to the discussion of the uh, of the actual CPA recommendation that we need to make to the council um, because there may be members of the public who are here to offer comment on that and. Uh, I want to have, have, make sure that they have the opportunity before we uh, have our own discussion. Um, I don't know how long Sarah is, uh, Marshall is going to be able to stay with us, but uh, I noticed earlier when I checked the audience that Sarah is here also. And uh, I don't think that, um, that uh, since she's a member of, you know, resource to the Finance Committee, um, I probably will want to have her uh, brought into the meeting when we get to that discussion. Uh, 
John, have you, uh, do you have an initial presentation that you want to make on the uh, transportation fund, the portion and the, the portion that really needs to be reviewed by this committee in order to um, have a presentation for uh, the town services and outreach committee before the uh, public forum that's required to be held. Sure, and, and what I was going to propose, if it's um, it's okay with you or it's okay with the committee, just so we make sure we have time for CPA, um, I was going to go over really quickly some of the documents that are available, and then I was thinking we would talk about um, the process to submit questions. And I think it we still have time for the next at the March eighth meeting to have sort of once those questions are in, come back with responses to those questions and have a detailed discussion. Um, before anything has to be given to TSO or, or sent to TSO. Um, so does that sound okay if I go over the, the materials quickly and then we talk about the issues and how to send in questions? TSO, they're sending all the questions um, in currently, but I don't think we've started that with Finance Committee. I think that's a good good suggestion. So okay. go ahead. All right. So let me share my screen. So does everyone see the um, Amherst permit parking regulations on the screen? Okay. Um, so what we proposed, uh, yeah. oh, you don't see it? This, do other people see it? Sometimes there's a little lag. All right, seeing Bob shaking, shake, shaking his head up, okay. Um, so what we proposed was increasing um, pretty much all of the permit fees um, related to our, our permit system. And so the permit system primarily covers the parking areas adjacent to downtown. It's not the lots downtown for the most part or the, the meters. It's the um, sort of the side streets around downtown where we try to encourage um, people who live or work in downtown. We try to encourage them to park there to, to leave the, the parking lots and the metered spots downtown available for, um, for residents and, and customers of the businesses. Um, and the other reason we propose these increases is that there, there haven't been any adjustments to these levels. Um, you know, Jen can correct me if I'm wrong, but since the permit system was created over 20 years ago, there haven't been uh, any changes to the price levels um, there. The one area that is in downtown and that's also covered by these regulations is the, um, the garage parking. Um, the, the lower garage system or re uh, reserve spots that are permitted spots as well. So there's a num this is what you're looking at right now are the actual permit regulations themselves that were in your packet. We kind of kept them in a red line version so you can see what the proposed changes are from the current. Um, a lot of the changes are just minor sort of um, cleaning up of language to make it consistent with the, the current form of government. So I'm just gonna focus quickly on the, um, the more substantial changes that we're proposing, which are the prices. Close your eyes if this makes you sick. Almost there, okay. So um, what we proposed, so there's a few different types of permits. There's the resident permit fee, uh, or there's the resident permit if you live or work in, live in downtown. There's the employee employer permit if you work in downtown. And then there's the reserve spot, as I mentioned. For the resident permit, we proposed um, increasing the fee and also splitting the permit into two different categories. One, if you have your vehicle registered in Amherst, one, if you don't have your vehicle registered in Amherst. And the rationale for that is if you don't have your vehicle registered in Amherst, we don't collect the motor vehicle excise tax related to that vehicle. Um, so they're, they're sort of identifying themselves as a resident by buying this permit, but we're not getting that tax revenue, which helps support um, roads, sidewalks, everything else in town. Um, so we've seen some other places that do this where there's a, a higher fee for that to reflect that loss of revenue. Um, so we also proposed the fee increases over three years um, so that people have time to adjust to the new levels. Um, currently it's $25. So what we proposed for vehicles registered in Amherst is that would double to $50 in FY23. It would double again to $100 in FY24 and then go up to 150 for FY25 and sort of stay there um, for reevaluation. Doesn't mean we couldn't change it again after that point. Um, the vehicles registered outside of Amherst, the fee would, um, I don't know what it is when it 
multiplies by six, but it would go up to $150 um, from 25 and then go up to $300 and then up to $400. And the intent again is that that fee is significantly higher than the, if your vehicle is registered an Amherst fee um, to reflect that loss of revenue. On the employee employer side, we wanted to increase the fees just because again, they haven't been touched in a while and, and the costs of the transportation system are more, um, have increased substantially since these were first put in place. But we also wanted to recognize that there are low wage earners um, in this in that group of people that worked in downtown and that we don't really want to make this a, a huge burden. Um, but we still want to encourage them to park um, outside of downtown and this fee is still substantially uh, less expensive than if you were to pay for the meter on a consistent basis. And then the last one here are reserve is it the reserve spot permits currently $1,000. This would raise it up to 1100, 1200, and then 1250. And some of the feedback we've heard, um, which I don't necessarily disagree with, not, you know, and hearing all the feedback and getting some more comparables, um, is that this fee maybe should go up even more than where it is currently, at, or end at a higher spot than 1250. Um, so those are the substantial changes, those fees increases. And then the one other thing I was going to show people. Um, do you all, did it, did it change to the budget for all of you on the screen? Okay. So in our budget book, this is the FY22, all these permit revenues go into our transportation fund, which is an enterprise fund. So it's separate than the general fund. Um, so all the costs of our parking system come out of the transportation fund and then all the revenues, meter revenues, um, parking ticket revenues, the permit revenues go into this transportation fund. And there's a few page, few pages in the budget book that summarize the activity. Um, so you can get a sense of what, what it looks like. So this is just a summary of the revenues that have gone into the transportation fund in the past few years, um, the expenses that have come out. Um, there's some service level information if, if people have questions on, um, on parking related uh, service levels that we, we collect every year. And there will be a new version of this coming out for FY23 when that budget is presented. Um, this is sort of a nice breakdown of the revenues that go into the transportation fund that you might find useful. This breaks it shows you how much comes from violations and fines. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out here is when you look at the parking permit, it's a the, currently it's a very small sliver of our overall revenues. Um, so the the parking permits, um, the resident employee permits, only account for you know, 25,000 of a mil about a million dollars per year. So roughly two and a half, three percent of revenues that go into this fund. So it's, it's been a sort of an insignificant overall piece of the um, revenue picture. And our proposed changes would increase this to about um, 100, $150,000 and allow us to invest more into capital improvements and things of that nature. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is how the parking permit fees relate to the, the reserved spots in the garage. So we have, I think, how many spots, um, 28 spots is it, Jen, that's, that are in the garage? Yes, 28. Okay, so those 28 spots in the garage bring in more revenue than all of the parking permit permits that we issue um, for the adjacent area. So just to kind of have that relationship that, um, that we generally will get more revenue out of a spot if we make it a reserve spot and, and sort of lock in that revenue relative to the other permits. Um, little pie chart. And then these are the expenses. So you can get a sense of what comes out of the transportation fund. Um, we have a number of staff um, parking enforcement um, and then some staff in the uh, staff member in the collector's office who deals with all the uh, permits that come in and um, doing hearings when there's when there's appeals of tickets and things like that. And then there are a number of operating expenses. Um, PBTA comes out of, there's a portion of PBTA that comes out of here. Um, there's all the, the supplies and um, we wanna, in, within this uh, section two, what we're trying to achieve is capital and debt. Um, you can see it's been sort of sporadic in terms of the amount that's been spent. We're trying to get a dedicated amount each year to capital um, slash debt, because it depending on how big of the project is, but like we do with sort of the general fund capital, we're trying to get to a point where we say 10 or 15% per year is dedicated to capital um, so that we can do things like replace lighting, put up new lighting where we've, where we've heard requests, um, put up the better signage. We'd like to be able to pay for the signage around parking out of here, um, things of that nature. I think that might be, it. yeah, there's a little bit more detail about 
um, capital, which we haven't done a lot of in the last few years. Um, and so the other documents, I'll stop there, the other documents that are in the packet, um, there was a presentation to TSO, which goes over the basics of the permit system a little bit that you could look at. Um, and then there's also a memo to the, uh, I think to the council that goes into the sort of where the town is at with implementing the recommendations of the downtown parking working group and how this revision to the permit system is within those sort of what we're working on with those recommendations. Um, I think this discussion discussion is specifically on the changes to the permit system, but I know there's a broader parking discussion that's also going on. Um, and so sometimes, you know, it kind of bleeds into the, the larger discussion. Sean, do you have the um, memo of January 14th available on your computer to show the uh, I think so. chart on the bottom of page two? That was yeah, the other let, me, let me share it. Um, this one here. I'm not seeing it yet, but uh, okay. what it is, is it's a spreadsheet at the bottom of page two. It's on my screen. Yeah. So what we did here was we were trying to show, so transportation has been the fund that has been most, one of the funds have been most impacted by the pandemic. So FY20, FY21 are not good examples of what a normal year looks like in the transportation fund. So we looked at um, FY18 to get an average roughly of what our revenues were at the time, what our costs were at the time. Um, and then we sort of extrapolate like, what do we want to have going forward? If we were able to dedicate a fixed amount to capital and a fixed amount to debt um, on an annual basis, which I think I use about 15% was what we were trying to achieve. Um, this is what it would look like. So we would need to increase revenues roughly $120,000 per year in, um, in order to achieve that. Um, and then on an annual basis, review fee levels and potentially adjust them on an annual basis to keep up with inflation of expenses. So this sort of, when we were talking about uh, changes to the permit system, we were trying to, those fee increases have them be driven by the needs of the transportation fund, not not just increasing revenue for revenue sake, but having it be tied to what we're trying to achieve in the transportation fund. So I'll look to see if there are questions. Michelle. Sorry, my box is moving around. <laughs> um, do disabled persons with a handicap a permit from either the state or the town, are they required to pay these fees as they're outlined? Jen? Um, anybody that holds a handicap placard or permit can park pretty much anywhere except for like the restricted areas that are like commercial loading zones. Um, but they can park at any metered space if it's closer than a handicap parking space and they don't have to pay for parking. Okay, and that would be true. Are they are they still so could they get a permit in one of the spots um, and and park there at no cost or did they if they wanted to have I don't even think they'd require a permit because they have the handicap placard they would be able to park there park anywhere. Okay, great. Thank you. Bob. Yeah, um, I have a couple of questions or one question the um, the non Amherst registration um, residents, who are these people? <laughs> so, um, so two things on that. So we haven't been able to collect good data on that in the past in terms of um, how, what, how many of them are there and just more information on maybe why the vehicle is not registered in Amherst. Um, I think we can maybe guess that it's probably, it could be college students who live somewhere else for um, sort of their, you know, where they came from, and then they come to college and they just never switch over the registration, even though they may be living um, in a dorm or, a, or an apartment somewhere for 10 months of the year, they may just never switch it over because, you know, you just never think to do it potentially, um, especially if it's just, if you don't plan on being here forever, you may just never think to switch it over. Um, but when we looked, we did a sample of our resident permits 
Um, I think we sampled about 20 or 25 of them. And we usually, um, or sorry, we sampled 20 or 25 of them. And about 75% of the ones we sampled were not registered in Amherst. So moving forward, we have a new um, online program that we can collect that information uh, when permits are apl applied for. I assume that they were probably short-term renters like college students mm -hmm. who, yeah. as you said, just never bothered to switch their registration over. Um, but I mean, I think it, it's something to consider as to whether we should require them to do that if they want to park downtown. Um, but that's really a discussion mm -hmm. for another time. Uh, the other question I had was, um, could we accelerate the uh, increase of the fees? I mean, we, we increase them over three fiscal years. Could we increase them over two years, for example? Um, you know, we're, we're already, I think, below market uh, rate on a lot of these. In fact, I, I checked on this UMass. I think UMass, the cheapest parking lot is like almost $400. I don't know if that's a year or a semester, but um, so we're 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 definitely, de you know, and especially for the the permits, we're definitely kind of below market rates as 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 we are now, and we don't have enough money to to pay for the capital improvements that we need. So that's another thing to consider. Um, the other thing I have, it's more of a a comment on the parking permits as they're laid out. Um, I, I, and, and this is this is just me coming from the, the for-profit world. Um, typically in the for-profit world, like at a mall, the, the employees don't park right outside the entrance. They park further away uh, mm -hmm. so that the quote unquote paying customers get the, the slots closer to the, the mall entrances. And I think we ought to reconsider how we're, where the permitted sp spaces are and where the employee spaces are in order to think about how to make the paying customers, so to speak, give them more access to parking close to town, to the town center. So just a thought, uh, it's not something that can be done overnight, but uh, it's something to think about. Yeah, can I respond to that real quick, Andy? Um... Yes. Yeah, so so the areas for the employee employee permits, they are sort of away from the, the storefronts and downtown that for exactly the reason you described They're again, they're in sort of the side streets away from downtown, wherever you see those signs with the blue, yeah. um, you know, they are sort of away from the businesses to make sure those spots are freed up for um, for customers and, and other people visiting downtown. Right, but I mean, you know, for example, the, the, the street by the police station there, that's pretty close to downtown. In other words, I would make that, I would make that parking meters and mm -hmm. move those spots somewhere else, personally. Okay. Um, th that's just a thought. I mean, sure. it, you know, I, I, I recognize that there's, the parking downtown is complicated. <laughs> you've got residents, you've got employees, you've got paying customers, and you have to kind of deal you have to kind of design your parking to, to meet the needs of all these people, these different people. So I understand it's complicated. Um, I just wonder whether we can, especially given that we've got to try to rebuild the economy downtown, if we could kind of rejigger things a little bit um, to get more people closer to, to, the, to the businesses. The, the one other thing I'll say on that, Bob, is there are other, um, there are other initiatives that the, we're working on um, going towards that same idea, um, looking at some of the private lots that are um, mm -hmm. available and seeing if we could work with them as partners to make those lots available to the public during certain during certain times of the year, certain times of the day, um, yeah. for the yeah for exactly what you described. Yeah, no, as I said, I understand it's complicated. I was just kind of throwing in some my some thoughts. Thanks. Okay, I just want to remind everyone that probably it's a good idea to try and uh, be brief in this section because we're going to come back to it at the next meeting. The request is that uh, questions of, um, that need investigation or more information um, be forwarded to Sean promptly, but um, after the meeting. And uh, we want to get on to public comment and CPA too and still 
um, keep an eye on the two hour um, promise. So, Kathy. Um, I will abide by that, Andy. Um, I'm going to build on Bob's comments, and I do. I'm going to amend. I I sent Sean a laundry list earlier this morning, like an hour before this meeting. But I can amend it because you've answered some of those. But um, in addition to Bob's comments on, do we want to go up more on the uh, fees sooner? I had a question of, can you? differentiate on the resident residents who have a our license plate can you potentially say that seniors might get a less of a rate you know as we go up on those rates so that would that's a question and what would that do if only 25 percent of them are actually downtown residents i didn't know whether we have a limit on the number of permits we you know we have a, a certain amount we're issuing but is that we won't issue anymore and then for the uh Resi the residents, I think we're talking just about downtown park. So you have to live downtown to be called a resident, correct? Right. So for the, the residents who didn't register their cars, can you do a proxy if you do your sample, they have to register and they have a, I've got a 12 year old Passat, for example, you know, like a best guess on what the excise fees would have been that we're foregoing because by we're, we didn't get a registration fee, we didn't get an excise fee. And with Bob's benchmark of what does UMass charge, I would go up faster on those like from this next year and uh, look at two justifications. One, this is what they'd have to pay at UMass and or this is what they would have otherwise paid for us and it's lost revenue um, because I think, um, so I'm gonna send questions about that. And then the, the last one is the Boltwood, underground garage parking spots to come one's a comment the current policy memo you just showed us doesn't mention reserve spots so you need to add a definition of them somewhere sure. it's the so the the second is that um both can we go up more but is would it make any sense to differentiate a share of those that aren't 24 7 so that you're buying it from not eight in the morning till seven o'clock at night. So we can open up those spots for evenings and weekends because my casual observation is they're often empty. Um, and it's 28 spots where when people are coming to downtown events where you cannot park there, the rest of the gar under garage is full. So I don't know whether we have a, a way of kind of um, taking some photos and whether that would make any sense, you know, so go up on the fee, but you could um, pay something less if you were willing to take it just for the work hours, you know, to secure a place. Mm -hmm. And my very last question, and I'll send this in, is can you differentiate between someone who lives downtown buying that reserve spot and someone who works downtown, or is there a restriction on eligibility? You can't just get a reserve space. If you live downtown, do you have to be not living downtown? You know, what, what's the eligibility to secure a spot that you can always park in? That it's, and I will just send that in so we can get answers back. Okay. Sean, if you don't have anything, I'll go Yeah, I think, I think we've got the, the whole list of questions. So it's probably better just to, answer those um, all together. Yeah, and I'll redo my memo. So I just focus on questions. So. Okay. Yeah, I wanna respect that request. Uh, I will send my questions in. I also wanna mention that in addition to us talking about this again on the 8th of March, that on the 10th of March, the uh, TSO will have a uh, hearing and they will also, um, uh, and that will be a committee of the whole meeting so that all of us are welcome to attend that. Thank you. And real quick on that, I think um, one of the things we're hoping to do, is, I think TSO at their next meeting, they're going to work on what the notice looks like. And then what we would like to do is once that notice is identified, use um, the emails that we have from permit holders to inform all the permit holders that this is coming. Um, I think a lot of them probably don't have any idea that this is being discussed and we want to make sure that they can, um, you know, voice their, their side of, um, of this at the hearing. 
Um, so, so we are going to do outreach, hopefully, to every permit holder um, to make sure that they can they have their chance to uh, give feedback. And uh, the other thing I'll mention, since I'm also a member of TSO, uh, is that uh, when TSO discussed this, the desire of TSO is that if the Finance Committee can get its um, comments regarding the financial implications of the proposal done for the 10th, that can be presented at the beginning of the meeting in the section of the meeting where presentations are made before it's the actual public forum, but then the information available to the public and to the, uh, to the committee during the public forum itself. And uh, that's why um, I have it back on the agenda for March 8th. Kathy? Just a quick note on that. Oh, I'm sorry, listen, I'm, I, I'm sorry. You, uh, I missed somebody who had a hand up because of the color on my screen. But thank you. Thank you. Um, so I also, my first impression was that the um, increases that were proposed were kind of low, but my question is, do we offer any accommodations for our vulnerable vulnerable population, um, like disabled low income? So like, do we offer any sliding scale fees or any payment plan options? So disabled, again, I think would fall under, would have the access to free parking wherever they need it. Um, the um, income is a, it's a tough one um, to think about because we do it with a lot of things. I think the, the issue that we've talked about is um, some, like for, if it was a student, for example, they may not have income, but still may have a, another source of income that maybe is not directly from work. And how do you kind of reflect that? Um, and the other thing we've tried to do is we've tried to keep the permit system sort of simple um, for people to understand and enforce. But if we, you know, I, I get your point that if we are going to raise fees uh, more substantially, it might be something we have to start to consider more in the permit system. Before the, the fees were so low that um, I think it, you know, that's why it probably was never considered. Um, Jen, do you have any other things you want to add to that? Um, we've just never had the question come up to offer anything like that. Um, my ask is that whatever is decided, we keep it as simple as possible because we have to communicate it to hundreds of people um, through the OpenGov program and in person on the phone. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. Yeah. Thank you. And I do, thinking about it, that I think that maybe especially if we're trying to use this to reach a certain goal, that maybe a sliding scale fee might not be a good option, but maybe payment plans might be, because sometimes a large amount at one time might not be possible, but if you could stretch it out across like a couple of months, that that might be an option and that might actually make it so that more people can hold permits. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion. I wonder if we could look at other communities and see whether any other communities have developed similar systems of sliding scale and how they're administered, whether it be for parking or for other public services, because uh, administering the system is complex, but the goal is uh, clearly understood. Kathy? Sorry. Um, I just, I did. Andy, I just have a comment on March 8th. Um, I would really like to be in the meeting that puts together our recommendations. And I have jury duty on March 8th. And I, it's not, I'm not going to be exempted because I am being called as a witness. So the police had to bring the summons to my house. Um, so I can't, unless the trial is settled out of court, I can't be there. So I didn't know whether we could meet on March 8th fifth which would be the week before i understand trying now that we're trying to meet before the hearing it's still two weeks from now so so that is if we can't we can't and i will do my best to <laughs> say what i think absent the information we're asking for which is uh um anyway that 
yeah. Let, let, uh, thank you for reminding me because you did uh, indicate that you had questions and problems with the schedule that was tentatively proposed. And uh, I wanted to come back to that uh, in, later in, um, but after we do the Community Preservation Act discussion, but it does need to be discussed today. So thank you for the reminder. Um, so is there anything else on parking right now? If there's not, um, I just urge all members of the committee to um, review the material and think about the financial implication questions. Um, you don't have to repeat ones that were presented today, but if there are, are, are other questions or more detailed questions, um, please get them in uh, to Sean. And uh, if you can get a copy to me and, but, uh, it certainly get them to Sean. So, so if there's nothing else, um, just looking at the screen and there's no hands up, then what I'm gonna do is um, turn to the uh, public um, comment question. And uh, uh, we do have some members of uh, attendees and if any attendees are interested in, um, participating in public comment, um, then please um, use the raise hand function um, and uh, we will proceed from there. And if there's any questions about how to proceed uh, for people who are on the, um, if there's anyone on the telephone, um, I think you uh, uh, participate by pressing um, star nine. So, um, but I see three hands up and I want to go ahead and uh, 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 ask you to limit your comments to three minutes, um, but um, uh, can we bring Sarah Marshall into the room and um, Robin uh, Fordham? Uh, uh, Sarah is in the room also as a um, principally as the uh, chair of CPA, but she also has her hands up to make a comment later. But I want to call on Robin for uh, comment now. Robin? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I don't see myself, so I'm assuming I'm not on camera. Is that right? That is uh, correct. So. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Um, I did send, um, I'm basically going to read a written statement that I sent to Andy this morning, but um, I'm not sure if everybody has had a chance to review it. So um, uh, I will just do that and then I will complete my comments. Uh, my name is Robin Fordham. I reside at 15 Taylor Street in Amherst. I'm a member of the Historical Commission. I'm a previous Historical Commission representative to the CPA Committee, and I'm currently pursuing a master's degree in historic preservation at the University of Vermont. I'm here, <coughs> excuse me, I'm here to speak on behalf of the application for CPA funding by the owners of the Conkey Stevens House. The application has been reviewed and recommended by both the Historical Commission and the CPA Committee including an adjustment to the proposed scope of work to eliminate those expenses, which are not directly related to historic preservation. In the Finance Committee's prior meeting, uh, it was established that um, CPA funds may be awarded to private entities, including those that are for-profit. And my understanding was that Amherst has made such awards in the past, thus establishing a precedent. I would therefore assume that members of the committee would base their votes on the merit of the project as it relates to the preservation of an established historic resource. I would like to address members' concerns about the question of public benefit in regard to this and any preservation project which receives CPA funds. It can be challenging for those outside the preservation community to understand the, the public view of an historic resource as sufficient enough reason to fund a preservation project, but it is a critical concept. 
in the pursuit of my studies, I've often had to explain this concept to others. And the best metaphor I've come up with thus far is to think of what we call the built environment as a living museum. Walking around or driving through Amherst, one is able to view the collections of this museum. We might experience aesthetic pleasure, curiosity, or intellectual connections as we take in the historic fabric of our town. In Amherst, the Conkey Stevens House is a prime example of this kind of specimen in our collection. Making informed, deliberative choices about preserving such resources allows us all the opportunity to experience this museum every day. Further, preservation of the collections of our museum yields other tangible benefits. Every day, people choose to explore or even relocate to areas where historic preservation is valued. Tourism, pride of place, and cultural enjoyment all contribute to the economic and general welfare of these communities. It is true that there is not an easy way to disentangle the benefit to the private owner from the benefit to the general public when considering the funding of these publicly visible resources. Any work completed in the public view obviously benefits both parties. At the same time, historic buildings present unique challenges to their owners and often historic, historically sensitive repairs exceed the costs of those for more contemporary structures. It is for this reason that CPA funding is such an important resource for private owners. As noted before, the applicant's funding request has been modified to make sure that only those repairs which benefit the public are funded through the CPA. As was noted in the prior meeting, many other concerns about this project can be addressed through the provisions of the required preservation restriction. I strongly encourage the members of this committee to support this application with the understanding that the community of Amherst will benefit in multiple ways from the preservation of this historic resource. Thank you for the opportunity to provide my comments. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your being here. Uh, can we have uh, Jane Mauld uh, brought in and uh, Jane, um, welcome and uh, can we uh, hear your comments and uh, try and limit to three minutes. Okay, yes, thank you, Andy. Thanks everyone for, um, for giving me this opportunity to uh, make a few comments um, as uh, chair of the Amherst Historical Commission. Um, I know that the Finance Committee at its, at its last meeting had a really um, robust and thoughtful conversation uh, about this particular project and about all of the, the, the projects uh, forwarded for approval for CPA funding. Um, you know, Robin has, uh, has just, I think, made one of the best statements I've heard about the public benefit of historic preservation, uh, whether a structure or a building or a, or a resource is a public or private one. Um, and I just wanted to, to comment very briefly on, um, you know, what is eligible for CPA funding? Um, how can those funds be used? Um, what is, is, what are the aspects of historic preservation that apply to this particular proposal for the Conkey Stevens House? Um, some of this also is going to be relevant to the to the Amherst Women's Club. Um, and how is the public perf purpose served by this project? Um, you know, I think. First of all, um, I, I, I believe that you all had um, arrived at this conclusion that you know the, the CPA Act does doesn't prohibit use of uh, funds for historic preservation projects on privately owned properties, and nor does it distinguish between privately owned and publicly owned properties in eligibility for CPA funding. Um, there's substantial pre precedent across the Commonwealth and indeed in Amherst for CPA funding of projects on private properties, as long as a public purpose is served. The Historical Commission um, certainly supports the eligibility of pri private projects for CPA proposals and has actually been um, looking for ways to encourage owners of historic resources to access those funds uh, in order to protect the overall um, significance of, his, of Amherst um, historic resources. Um, this proposal uh, 
it addresses preservation and, and rehabilitation uh, as two of the allowed categories under CPA. The others, acquisition and restoration, are not, uh, not precisely applicable in this case. Um, you know, clearly the majority of work items contained in their proposal match these definitions, and we've tailored, as Robin mentioned, tailored uh, the specific funding areas to um, align with the importance of preservation and, and rehabilitation. Um, the, uh, the public purpose and the public benefit, in a way, are slightly separate. Could uh, you, uh, Jane, bear in mind the time problem we have? Okay, uh, thank you. I just, just will mention that the public purpose typically is served by the acquisition of a preservation restriction. The public benefit is broader, and I think since Robin has described that so, so, so well and so carefully, um, I will just leave, uh, leave her explanation and description with you. So I'm urging, urging you to support uh, the Conky Stevens proposal so we can take care of one of our national uh, register landmarks in town and um, uh, the other CPA proposals as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, and we have, uh, I think Catherine Lombardi is uh, also asked to be recognized. So, Catherine? Mute, okay, am I unmuted now? Yes, you are, and we can hear you, welcome. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm Catherine Lombardi, and I am the current president of the Amherst Women's Club. I noticed during the process of applying for the CPA grant that some people really do not know much about the Women's Club and what we actually do. Uh, we were founded in uh, 1893 and for the purpose, besides of providing at that point in time, a place for women to gather, um, Founded for the purpose of community service and education. Those are our two of our most important um, charter obligations. We've had the we have owned the Alice Maud Hills house since uh, for the last hundred years, but since 1922 when we were willed the house by Alice Maud Hills. Since then, for the last 100 years, we have maintained the house, we have preserved the house, and we have, um, um, anyway, we've made it more beautiful inside. We've done a lot of decorating besides preservation and maintenance. And the um, way we make our money is renting the house that has been very difficult the last few years. I just wanted you to know that our meetings are open to the public, that we provide scholarships for high school students every year, and that we provide uh, grants to community services that need some money for uh, children or students or senior services mainly. That's just all I wanted to say, a little bit of information about the club itself. Okay. If anybody has any questions, I would be glad to ask them, but that's all I had to say. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Okay. Um, Sarah, did you have any initial comment that you wanted to offer or um, before we jump into the um, conversation? Thank about... you, Andy. I would just add that um, regarding the, the whether a view is the sufficient public benefit. Um, family member put it succinctly this morning by saying, isn't that the whole point of an historic district? So I would um, suggest that <laughs> the fact that Amherst does want to have um, historic districts is an indication that it cares a great deal about the public having views of an historic um, collection of buildings as uh, Robin put it. Um, so that's all, I'll remain on the call in case you have questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Athena, could you just leave Sarah in the room so that we can proceed? Uh, I did watch the last meeting and it seemed that there were only two 
um, of the proposals that had significant questions last time, this one, and there was some questions about pickleball, which I also note that there was a whole thing on Morning Edition today about pickleball, uh, coincidentally, for those who are Morning Edition listeners. Uh, are there any other items on the list of CPA proposals that um, the com any member of the committee would like to enter for discussion besides those two? Uh, Lynn? That's not why I have my hand raised. Okay. So, um, therefore, um, I'm going to assume, um, in, unless there's objection, that um, there, uh, there's agreement and support for all other proposals so that we can just quickly focus on those two um, to the extent that they're questions. And uh, I, uh, so Lynn, uh, back to you, and then I wanna uh, start recognizing raised hands uh, going around, but you were first. Andy, thank you for uh, stating it that way. I, in fact, agree that there is serious question on these two proposals, but I want to be clear about why. I don't question whether they're eligible with regard to CPA funds. I don't question the work of the committee or the earnestness of the various organizations that have come forward. What I have to say is we have to decide how best to spend our tax money. And... I think Bernie made some excellent suggestions about and Barrington and so forth last time. Um, if it would be easier at this point to go ahead with the rest of the recommendations, then I think we should do that. And I think we should examine whether or not we might want to set a limit. Uh, obviously it would be informal because we can't formally do that on how much we would put forward to privately owned and nonprofit um, uh, buildings uh, with regard to historic preservation. And I would mention that one of the most recent ones that I remember was 50,000 that we gave to the JCA for their preservation of their steeple. And I, I just have to say that I, I, I really struggle with saying this to our community, but at last Thursday, we sat in a four towns meeting where we're talking about the use of CPA funds for our track, for our youth, for the health of many people in the community. And that's, that's just a budget buster for us. We don't even know if they're gonna come forward, but we have tough choices to make in Amherst and CPA isn't immune from those tough choices. Thank you. Bernie? Yeah, I just wanted to sort of clarify what I was talking about the last time. Um, and, and uh, you, you know, and I agree <clears throat> with Lynn completely that we do have to make some very difficult choices. Um, that's part and parcel of public management. There's, there's always more demand than there is money. I'm not second guessing the opinion of the Historical Commission or the CPA committee. Um, I've helped establish CPA in two communities. Uh, Stu Saganor has been known to say nice things about me. I trained as a historian, so on, so on, so on. What I'm concerned about <clears throat> is that we are, that we have adequate protection for the town's investment in these properties. And we were making capital improvements to these properties. And so um, to be told that preservation restrictions would be negotiated down the line, um, I, I can appreciate that in some regard, but I would prefer to know what the re preservation restrictions are up front. And I'd prefer those restrictions have some enforceability and teeth to them. So if we're, we're gonna put money, capital improvements into a, a, a property, then I wanna know that if the property is sold, that um, maybe this, some of that money comes back to the town um, because it'll be sold for profit. Uh, uh, if uh, there's a proposal to, uh, we wanna make sure that if there's ever a proposal to demolish the property, that the town has some real say in it beyond a year's stay 
um, and, and so on. So I'm not opposed to the, you know, the CBA committee has, they've made a decision based on what's in front of them, not what, uh, uh, what may be out, all that might be out there. And so I'm not opposed to the, the, the proposals. What I do want to see is adequate and substantial preservation restrictions up front as part of the proposal. Okay, thanks. Yeah, okay. um, I wanna build on both Lan what Lynn and Bernie just said without repeating, um, particularly without repeating Lynn's opening comments, which were, were which were pretty much what I was going to say. Um, so I would like to separate these two items out so we don't hold up the rest and then come back for a discussion if we don't have time to do it today. I agree with Bernie on trying to adopt a policy about an upfront. And my then I have a more general question, which goes to Lynn's comment is, I think these are, it's clear these are eligible. It's clear that uh, every, all decisions, I can understand uh, the arguments for this. Um, but my observation is that the tendency then is whatever happens to be in this year's queue has a chance of getting a green light, even if we know right behind it is a project that we probably would have wanted to fund. <laughs> they just weren't ready. And CPA has the ability to reserve money, um, you know, so it doesn't have to spend out or spend up. So we could be thinking that way. We could be thinking about a two year or three year horizon. And when I'm saying we, it may be the council. So my question of both Lynn, Andy, Sonia, the people who know about how this functions, if the council wanted to create some guidelines that would say these are, we voted as a town to impose this surcharge on our taxes. Uh, there are general guidelines on what CPA money can be used for. We're not disagreeing them, but we want, we want some policy that we would like to adopt as guidance. So I don't know what the limits are of our doing that. And that's one of the reasons I want to table these two just to anchor the discussion on knowing what we can do as the council, um, as opposed to what the CPA com committee uh, does. And, and I'll just frame this that there was a, two or three years ago, there was a suggestion that the council set a policy on how much should go for affordable housing every year and use that as a guideline for CPA. And we didn't decide to do that, but it was proposed that, you know, we, we designate that we would like a substantial portion to meet housing needs, um, whether the, and then you could reserve it. So that's my question on, can we do a policy like that? And then the Bernie question, I think it's well within our powers to implement what he's suggesting in the short term, you know, that, these could be funded, but with the following provisions, but I don't know how to go about doing that either. So I want to separate these two out because I don't have any questions. I think everything else um, for me is a total yes vote without questions. Thank you. I'm going to hold any responses or thoughts that I have until I, we hear from Michelle and Matt. Michelle? Yeah. Um, so building on all of that, and maybe this is another step or a different approach, um, should we consider um, recommending that our town attorney write a brief opinion, essentially, on what options we have in order to satisfy the public purpose of the anti-aid amendment? Um, so that's that's one thought. <clears throat> and in the little bit of research I did about this, it, uh, it says that many municipalities do do that. So they have something on record that um, indicates what those options are. And that could include the, uh, the preservation restriction, public access, repayment upon sale, all of those options that we've been throwing around. 
Um, the other question I have is <clears throat> if there is to be a restriction placed on the Conkey Stevens house, given it's a condo, um, and in my experience with real estate, I'm certain, I think, or fairly certain at least, that the individual condo owners um, would need to vote or, or have some sort of, and, and maybe it's different when it comes to this particular CPA funding, but it seems to me that individual condo owners would need to approve probably by a majority vote, um, adding a restrictive covenant to their HOA covenant agreement. Um, so those are my thoughts for right now. Thank you, Matt. I just real quick, um, you know, being new and, and like Michelle doing a little bit of research, um, I was just, I was surprised to look over time at the variation and how much the state was chipping in on, um, on CPAC. I mean, and Sean was helpful in that, but I, I just was surprised. I mean, at a glance, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it, it's as little as seven or 8% that the state might contribute to the, to the towns overall and up to you know, some really high years in the high 30 and 40%. And, and that, that surprised me that wide of a variation when I think about the incentive for the CPAC. Um, just, I, I, I most of you probably knew that already. Uh, and then a, I guess a question, although I think, again, um, previous speakers have said this uh, better than I, but, but a question is, um, would offering low interest loans to for, for, for profit entities be, or private entities in general, be an be uh, available use to the funds? But I, I agree with Michelle that we should ask the town council to let us know what some of the options would be. But that's that's one question I would have is if that would be a permissible use. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not gonna separately comment on it because I can't add to what has already been said. Uh, as far as uh, what the state has provided is its portion, it's a complex topic and I'm um, sure we can uh, give a more complete presentation, but basically there's numerous factors involved in that because the number of towns that are participating in the Community Preservation Act program has increased. And as the number of towns have increased, that means that more towns are have um, a right to a piece of the state portion of the uh, money. Um, in addition, uh, there's um, other factors of uh, legislative decisions. And uh, I think that it's combination of those two things that have caused the percentage to decrease over time. Either Sonia might have a uh, better explanation than that. Uh, Sonia, do you? anything I'd add? No, I think you um, you covered it. But when we first started off, we were at 1% here in Amherst. And we increased to one and a half, and then we went to 3%. But when we were at 1%, we were getting 100% back. And that's really unusual from the state because there were so few so few municipalities and cities in the, in the mix. But as we keep adding, like Andy said, we keep adding municipalities, it does increase does decrease the amount that the state reimburses and it is that's why we budget very conservatively each year on the state because we don't know we've seen it be way up and then drop down to single digit so okay thank you can I, andy can i say something else sure. i don't think there's a way where the council can direct the cpa on what their recommendations are um i've never heard of that in any of the municipalities or any of the meetings I've gone to. But um, basically the CPA makes their recommendations to the council or town meeting and town meeting can reduce that amount if they feel, or council, if they feel so, but they cannot change a recommendation or change an, uh, or add to it, but they can reduce the total amount. I just want to bring that up. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's a, an important point. The other thing I was just going to say, and then I want to get um, to Bernie, whose hand is up, is that uh, last year we made a decision to recommend that the council 
adopt all of the programs in the fell soup except for the library grant and consider the library grant on a separate schedule and um, we created a date certain in which we were going to um, and I think this was a decision of the council president not the committee uh, then to um, do the library grant and, and at a specific date and established what the date would be but um, we can make that recommendation um, and there is precedent for it. Bernie? Uh, yeah, just to, to um, echo a couple of uh, comments that have been made, and Sonia, is, uh, as usual, is correct about um, what this council could do with the CPA recommendations. Uh, CPA has a, a pretty wide latitude to determine this stuff. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, Michelle's right on target in saying that we need to go to the town attorney with this. Um, the statute gives a considerable latitude in terms of interpretation to the town's legal counsel. So if we want to discuss uh, what's reasonable in terms of preservation restrictions or um, can we, um, can, can uh, how, either the CBA committee or the town might adopt uh, some additional targets in terms of spending. Those are really questions for, for uh, the town attorney. And uh, fortunately, we've got some pretty adept counsel, um, as particularly in terms of, of land use. So, I, I, you know, I think we should look to uh, ask couple, uh, KP Law about this. Um, Sarah, your hands up. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Sonia will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that CPA funds could be used um, to pay for an attorney's, I don't know, work to design some model uh, deed restrictions or some, you know, some kind of um, preservation requirement. That, that I think um, it would, would be burdensome to ask proponents to uh, do that work ahead of time. Um, I expect it's expensive and they don't, can all perhaps uh, pay for that advice before they even know if they're going to receive a grant. Thank you. Thank you. I think that there was one other question that was raised in there and uh, this is not anything I've had any familiarity with, and that is uh, setting up a loan program through with CPA funds as a loan program. I don't know if either Sarah or Sonia have uh, ever heard of another community doing that or any experience we've had of doing that. I have not. I don't think that it's allowed, but I can. we can check. And I would say I don't know why that's one would feel more confident about that than <laughs> uh, than just putting a rest, uh, restriction on to recover money in case of sale or whatever. Mm -hmm. no, it was only a question that was asked, and I was trying yeah. to cover. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't really think it's it is allowed, but we can ask. Um. Is there um, a, a feeling of the committee that we recommend um, a group of uh, proposals for adoption immediately and um, withhold others? I'm not going to make the motion because I'm not going to pick the programs, the, the, the grants that uh, somebody would want to include in the motion. I have to leave that, I want to leave that to whoever's going to offer a motion. But I uh, uh, want to proceed so that we can keep on the time. Lynn? So I don't have the list in front of me, uh, but let me, uh, here's the motion. I move that we recommend that the town council fund the CPA projects as recommended by the CPA committee, but hold aside 
the two related to historic preservation, specifically uh, the women's club and the, um, I wanna get the name right, please go. Um, it's Conkey Stevens House. The Conkey Stevens House, thank you. Salem Place, HOA until we have uh, obtained additional legal counsel. Shane seconds. So just for my clarification, we're, we're changing the bottom line and only funding the remaining projects. Correct. Are we holding on the whole thing? No, we're funding all of the other projects. At, we're recommending to the council that they fund all the other projects. And that will be the subject of a public forum in March and we'll be able to proceed. Can I ask for a clarification? Um, Sonia, which line is the women's? They're both under historic preservation. Is, is it A.M. Hill's house or Simeon Strong house? It's A.M. Hill's. Thank you. Somehow I got thrown off of the call and um, just did reconnect. My computer reconnected just now. So I missed. Um, but I assume we have a motion, understand we have a motion on the floor that was offered by Lynn. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Bill, did you capture that? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Lynn moved that the finance committee recommends that the town council fund the CPA projects as recommended by the CPA committee, but hold aside the two related to historical preservation, the women's club or the A.M. Mills house and the uh, Conkey Stevens house, which is also the, um, uh, the uh, Salem, whatever it is, uh, homeowners association, until they have until the council has obtained additional legal counsel. Um, so, Athena, if I could help you out here, the um, total historic preservation on that council order is now a total of eighty one thousand seven hundred, and the bottom line total is two million fifteen thousand seven hundred and thirty nine. And that's the total of this appropriation order. And I'll make the changes and send that to you. Thank you, Sonia. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Was there a second to that motion? Uh, yeah. Kathy seconded it. So we do have a motion on the floor. Okay, Michelle, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so do we meet again before the public hearing? And is there, if we were lucky enough to get a legal opinion quickly, um, would we be able to sort of loop or bring this back into the fold um, for full review, to be part of the full review again? The answer is yes and yes. Great. Have you set the date on the public hearing on this? Can I also just offer that Removing both of these brings the total of historic preservation projects down to, well, I'd, I'd have to see what there is in debt. So I'll hold that. But if it's under, if we don't um, program at least 120,000, I think that's new revenue, then we need to put the remainder of that, make that up in a reserve for historical preservation for future use, just so everyone knows that to meet our 10% goal. Sarah? Yes, I, I don't know how the motion language works, but is the finance committee is committed to returning to those two projects and potentially recommending them? It, it, it's unclear when you say, um, like putting aside or does that mean you will come back to them or are you rejecting? May I just clarify, it's my intention that we come back to them. 
that we take the various issues that have been raised here that Andy and I work with our town, with Sean and the town manager to see what questions we wanna ask of legal counsel. We are not rejecting them. We are putting them aside for the moment until we have further information from town council. I think that the, if I understand it correctly, that the goal of this is, is to give assurance to all of the other applicants that have submitted proposals that have been recommended by the CPA committee, that the finance committee is recommending them to the council so that um, it removes any anxiety on their part and we um, as a committee can focus on the um, ones that have been identified by committee members, which I gather there are two. And, and just to be clear, the earliest that we would be holding the public forum for the council, it would be on the 21st of March and the vote would possibly be that, but that can be changed. We try to move it as early as we can so, and take it out of cycle with the rest of the budget so that people can start counting on the money they are receiving. And I think there was another purpose and that was to uh, make sure that the JCPC on the earliest possibility would have an indication of where the council is going on CPA so that it could do that, have that information as it developed the uh, capital improvement plan as required by the charter. Sean? Um, I just wanted to let you know, I have to, um sign off for another meeting, but um, Sonia will stay and she obviously can handle anything that you have for questions. So thank you all. Okay, I think what we wanna do is go ahead and vote on this and then um, quickly return to the date question that Kathy raised and uh, um, adjourn because we are um, way over time at this point. And uh, so at that point, um, is there any further discussion on the motion on the floor or can we proceed to a vote? Seeing no hands, um, let me just uh, go through a vote process. Uh, Kathy? Yes. Alicia? Yes. I'm a yes. Uh, Shell? Yes. Uh, Bernie? Yes. Let's see, uh, Matt? Support. Lynn? Yes. Bob? I have to recuse myself because my son's getting married at the Amherst Women's Club this <laughs> October. <laughs> so I think that we have everybody and the, it's unanimous of the voting members. Uh, Two members are supporting and one member has declined to indicate um, a position because of personal reasons and we'll just leave it at that. Uh, so uh, that uh, I think uh, ends the discussion for this point. Um, we will get it back on a future agenda for the remaining pieces in the meantime. Um, if you have uh, anybody who has suggestions, please send them to uh, to me and to Sean uh, as to what you would like, how you would formulate that. Otherwise, we will uh, uh, meet with, uh, including Lynn, to uh, uh, work with Paul Bachelman and get the appropriate questions to uh, um, the town attorney. Is there anything else to be said on the subject of uh, CPA? Then the one thing that I wanna do really quickly is that um, I had put forward some dates for next meetings and um, uh, Kathy already gave, uh, explained the problem that she can't be there for the eighth. And I think that the 22nd was a problem for you too. You don't have to explain the problem, but I just want to confirm it was a problem. 
the the 22nd is a problem but the eighth and, and I, I will correct my statement i'm not on the jury i'm being summoned to be part of the trial um and so i'm not likely to get out of it unless they settle the other is a long is an appointment that i don't think i can switch um but just on the 22nd it is possible that I can be there for most of the meeting on Zoom, um, but I want to be there for the parking discussion. And I looked, Andy, the fifth would still be before the forum, which I think is why you scheduled it for the eighth um, for the discussion. So we can get answers back to some questions and we can provide a recommendation or we can participate on the March 10th forum. So I just looked at what am I no not the eighth the it wouldn't be the eighth it would be the first sorry March first would be a Tuesday I'm sorry I I, I had the wrong calendar up yeah I was going to ask about that no 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 clearly it was March March first is still two weeks from now so it felt like there's enough time for Sean to get back to us if we submit him and so that was my suggestion. Um, and I don't want everyone to bend just around me. If we can't, I will just do my best to see what answers come back. And I can't participate in the meeting if I'm sitting on a witness. Let's, let me let me move this along. Uh, could people look at their calendars real quickly and raise their hand if March first uh, is a acceptable date? in which people can meet and uh, that way we will uh, uh, I'll look, just look to see if we have raised hands uh, using the raise either. Sorry, Andy, I have a quick question. So we're moving it to March 1st from which date? The 8th. So it would be the 22nd and the 1st, not the 8th. Uh, I was going to handle this 22nd separately. Okay, so uh, time. okay. And I uh, have a suggestion for that, but I want to get the next meeting done. Okay. So I think that uh, we can, uh, we, we have agreement to just go ahead and move the eighth to the first and to have the next meeting. Matt cannot, first. Matt cannot meet on the first. Is that correct, Matt? The first, I'm sorry, the first of March? Yeah. Yeah. I cannot, but you know, you guys can sally forth without me. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Okay, so um, Matt, I'm sorry that uh, we've gotten into this problem. Uh, what I'm gonna do is uh, work with um, either um, Athena or Sean to get a doodle poll out for the uh, other meeting, the next meeting, the 22nd, and, uh, and I'll see if we can find an alternative date for that, but I didn't feel that it was um, compelling to do it now. Um, because it's so late and we're so beyond the two hour limit that we've set, um, I was wondering if we anybody would object to uh, putting the minutes into the next meeting and make sure that we make that happen and uh, that we can adjourn today's meeting. Kathy? Um, I agree with that, Andy. And I was just going to suggest um, using the process Lynn and Athena have, if we see a change in the minutes that we want to suggest we get that to, um, I guess these came from Athena or Bill, so that we don't have to spend, I just had one change, um, one edit. You can you can send changes to me and I'll okay. put them into the next packet with those changes. Thanks. So yeah, I think that's a good suggestion and I appreciate it. Thank you, Kathy. So if, <clears throat> as you've read the minutes, if there were any amendments you were planning to offer, please just send them to Athena and uh, we'll see if we can get a new set of minutes and get that cleared up. And that's how we've been dealing with uh, council minutes if uh, people identify things in advance. So um, 
is there anything i have nothing else that is not anticipated if nobody else has a request and i think uh we need to adjourn thank Seeing you everybody so, so i we are adjourned so thank you <laughs>